gender sensitive services have been able to address some of the stigma and violence that, face, that are faced by women who use drugs and women caught in the, in the criminal legal system. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to ask your questions to our panelists. We've got an amazing um, range of women with us today. We're really privileged. Uh, so there is a Q&A section. So please uh, ask your questions and we'll go back to them at the end of the event. Um, so in terms of our panelists, I will introduce them as we move along the webinar. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our wonderful keynote speaker, Dr. Mary Chinesi Hess. Mary is a retired international civil servant who worked um, at the United Nations as a resident coordinator and UNDP resident representative serving in several countries. She was the first African woman to be appointed to that position. She was then appointed as the first woman deputy director general of the International Labour Organization with the rank of Under Secretary General to the UN. She also served as the chief advisor to the president of the Republic of Ghana and she currently serves on the five member African Union panel of the wives. She's a commissioner of the West African Commission on Drugs and a representative of IDPC in Ghana. Mary, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's my privilege to be among such nice people. Uh, I'm addressing you, of course, from Accra, which is a uh, bang in the center of the earth for this very critical conversation on gender and drug policy titled overcoming stigma and violence against incarcerated and drug using women and this is on the sidelines of the 66th session of the commission on the status of women as we know well i I join you, as has been mentioned uh, by Marie, in my capacity as a commissioner of the West Africa Commission on Drugs. I have been privileged to be part of this distinguished independent group of Africans with members uh, coming from politics, civil society, health, security, and the judiciary. We carried out fact-finding research to understand the drug situation in my region, that is uh, West Africa. The commission, in the end, produced a publication titled, Not Just in Transit. And uh, I highly recommend it for everybody's reading. You learn a lot of what is happening in our part of the world. The commission actually was convened by the late uh, Mr. Kofi Annan, who was uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, who saw drugs and drug policy as an important issue that affects all areas of life, especially in West Africa, giving it the status of a front burner problem. This was very, very important for us because up until then, it was difficult to grab the attention of policymakers in our sub-region when we start talking about drugs. But uh, his presence made all the difference. And uh, the commission is chaired by the former president of Nigeria, his Excellency Olusegu Obasanjo. Uh, we had a number of heads of state as well sitting with us uh, to be able to open doors, which we managed to do. The commission's findings just reinforce the well known fact that most users, small time dealers, and drug couriers have among them many women who were equally arrested and imprisoned for low-level drug offenses. What we observed, however, was that the women who were arrested tended to serve longer years in prison than the men. 
I must say myself that I was not aware there were so many women caught up in the trade one way or the other. Of course, we knew there were uh, female drug users, but uh, I'll address that later. Uh, of course, and this matches the global situation. I don't know if we are correct, but what we are seeing from the literature is that uh, many women and girls go to jail and tend to serve more extended years for low level drug offenses than their male counterparts in other parts of the world as well. I like uh, if anybody can address this issue because we have to find out why. Uh, this is happening. But uh, it is for this reason that I consider it uh, a happy and significant uh, development that this subject matter has found a place as an event on the sidelines of the Commission on the Status of Women. My hope is that uh, this is not uh, just a one-off and that is going to continue to be an item somehow on the agenda so we can grab international attention, which will help us very much. At the best of times, statistics indicate that women continue to be disadvantaged and women's condition has been proven not to be best globally, with women concentrated in undervalued and low paid jobs and with poor working conditions. Women, in addition, suffer from lack of education, training, and also unequal remuneration. In other words, there are so many inequalities. So on top of all this, women drug users suffer from a sort of double jeopardy because their condition is worsened by societies extremely negative perception because of this habit. What we find in Africa is that women drug users are stigmatized a lot more harshly than men. Uh, whereas a, a man smoking in public will not necessarily raise eyebrows in most African countries. A woman seen with a degrade in her mouth in many of our countries, uh, might even attract stone. It's very, very, uh, you know, hard on women when it comes to this. So, in a society like Ghana, where marijuana, for example, is referred to as the tobacco of the devil, a a woman with this habit is treated as the devil incarnate and a bad example to woman. She is stigmatized much beyond a man would be treated who has the same habit. Indeed, she might even be ostracized and denied completely by, by her family. In this situation, she might be driven out of the house and pushed into vagrants. She is in this manner running the risk of exposure to the ills of women on the street, such as sex work, alcoholism, violence, petty theft, etc. And she has to do many of these things to survive once she's uh, pushed onto the street. If she happens to be a mother, her children will likely be taken from her, which is very, very hard for an African woman. Sadly, the criminal and legal system also tend to treat her very harsh. Of course, because of the social imperatives, uh, there's a lot of intolerance. That's the point I'm trying to put across to show that the condition of a woman drug user uh, is much, much worse than that of any man. And, uh, Society and policy makers need to appreciate, therefore, that women and men are affected differently by their drug use. Uh, I must commend civil society 
for its role in starting research, which brings visibility to this issue. This is the solid call for civil society to continue with this research and uh, to continue to assist us in giving more visibility to this bad situation. What we would want is for policymakers to package intervention or assistance differently. Because uh, unless we do this, we are not sure that the special situation of women are being uh, addressed. Uh, the point must be made very, very strongly that uh, the woman drug user should not be treated as a criminal. This is what we have been campaigning for in our coverage. Indeed, that in the hands of law enforcement officers, she should not be taken to prison, but to a clinic for rehabilitation. She should not be taken to prison, but to a clinic for rehabilitation. Of course, I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk about the plight of women prisoners, and therefore I will leave this topic. Uh, I can just continue. I've noted that uh, the impact of drugs on women and, and so on uh, has, has been improved by civil society organizations. And I want to seize this opportunity to express gratitude to them for their noble work. Um, in this manner, they have helped to raise the profile of many outstanding women who use drugs and play a leadership role in this regard across Africa. And let me just at this point applaud a few of these women, um, these outstanding women um, who use drugs uh, and uh, who fight to improve the women's condition as far as this is concerned. I don't know if Happy is there, but Happy, I'm hoping you are listening to me from Tanzania. I'm recognizing and sharing you on very much. We met in Nairobi, as you will recall. Um, Angela from South Africa, Cindy, there are two Cindy's, um, one is Hedo Yao and then Cindy Trevedi of Mauritius, Rita from Kenya, in fact there are many others. I think we should encourage them by recognizing them on a forum such as this one. To give them courage to do what they are doing. I tell you the situation is not uh, easy in Africa. I salute all these great, amazing women for their contribution. It's time for all of us, and especially for all women who are suffering silently without the willpower to speak about the drug use. The West African Commission on Drugs, I'm so fin finished very soon. The West African Commission on Drugs observed that after our advocacy for legislative reform aimed at decriminalization of drug use, many of our governments had problems in drafting a revised law. It is for this reason that the Commission proposed a model law that will serve as a template for policymakers, as a guide to drafting drug laws, and ensure that public health and human rights issues are factored in. More importantly, that attention is given to vulnerable groups and women who are highly stigmatized in our African context. It's been very useful. We have so many women, so many governments who have taken advantage of this and we find it is helping to improve the situation, especially 
for women, and I commend it for use by other regions. Finally, I'd like to mention that uh, recently there was a historic judgment of the African court on vagrancy and the vagrancy law, which are still supported by many of our governments. The court in its judgment indicated that these vagrancy laws were deemed unconstitutional and should be abolished. We think in West Africa that this law, this judgment is extremely important because you have so many women on drugs who are caught in a vagrancy situation. So the judgment now is imposing uh, very, very strict rules on the uh, government in respect of how vagrants are, are handled. And uh, we are hoping that uh, it will help to improve uh, the lot of um, poor, vulnerable populations, uh, homeless, uh, loyalists, etc. We very, very, very impatient with many people. And uh, there's need for advocates. In, uh, in Africa on many issues. And uh, I'm hoping that everybody will join us as we, we try to do a little bit in, in, in this regard. Yeah. I, I want to just say again how happy I am to be seeing such uh, nice, nice people involved uh, in trying to help. And Marie, I'm very, very happy to see you again. Uh, Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, and thanks a lot for participating um, and for highlighting all of the many issues that women are facing in terms of gender inequalities and the levels of stigma and, as you say, intolerance that they're confronted to when they're in contact with the illegal drug market and the criminal legal system. I mean, this is obviously a trend in Africa, but I think, you know, the rest of the panelists will show that this is a trend worldwide and we need to not forget that. Um, I think the lack of data and invisibility on the issue that you have mentioned as well shows that there is a need for civil society to continue doing the work that we do in terms of highlighting these issues everywhere we go in all relevant UN forums. Um, and yeah, that's why I'm really glad that this, the discussion can take place today at CSW and obviously Dianova in the past and also two, uh, two days ago have uh, organized quite a few events on, on drugs and women at CSW. So I hope that we'll continue working together on that. Um, and thanks a lot for mentioning the work of the amazing women who use drugs across Africa. I mean, you know, Happy, Cindy, many others there, you know, they take risks as well doing that. And, um, in this side event, we're very privileged to have Andrea and Kenya who will share their stories as well. And that requires quite a lot of courage. So thanks so much for doing that. Um, so one other thing that Mary mentioned in, is the various ways in which the West Africa Commission on Drugs has worked to promote reforms. And in particular, with the aim of reducing the over-incarceration of people convicted of drug offenses. Um, in parallel with these events, and as mentioned earlier, many of the women have been mobilizing in various parts of the world to promote reforms and call for the decarceration of women, reclaiming their basic human rights. And this is particularly urgent when we're discussing drug policy reform, because globally, a third or more than a third of women deprived of their liberty are incarcerated for a drug offense. So we're facing a major crisis here. And in various countries in Latin America and Asia, this can go up to 50 to 80% of women incarcerated. Um, and these women are usually, as, as Mary said, in situations of high vulnerability prior to their incarceration. And many of them are also single mothers, so that has implications. Um, so here, I would like to introduce our second panelist, Andrea James, who is the founder and executive director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls in the United States. Andrea is also the founder of Families for Justice as Healing, a 2015 Soros Justice Fellow and recipient of the 2016 Robert Kennedy Human Rights Award. As a former criminal defense attorney and also as a formerly incarcerated woman, Andrea has been able to share her personal and professional experiences to raise awareness on the effects of incarceration of women on themselves, but also on their children and their communities. 
Her work is focused on ending the incarceration of women and girls in the United States and also around the world and shifting the justice system um, that, you know, that goes away from criminalization towards uh, community solutions. So Andrea, thanks so much for being with us today. I know you're super busy these days. Um, so just in just a few years, the National Council has grown into a national network of more than 5,000 members. 5, members. Um, sorry, I'm just going to mute you for a second. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about what led you to found the National Council and what you're trying to achieve today uh, through the National Council? But specifically, could you tell us about your campaign that calls on President Biden to grant clemency to 100 women in his first 100 days in office? Because I, I know there's quite a lot of movement going on on that right now. So um, apologies to folks who cannot hear me. Um, I am going to just move forward as I'm asked. Um, so we were uh, women incarcerated in a federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut and um, in 2010. And in a federal prison with a majority of the women that were there were, were, were uh, black women, black and brown women, uh, African-American and Latina, Latinx women who were uh, sentenced for drug uh, 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 convictions. And those drug convictions um, at uh, the time and continuing today were uh, uh, drug convictions that carried very significant and very heavy penalties. Um, most of them in the, in, the, in the framework of mandatory minimum sentences, which means you were sentenced to these very long and draconian sentences, 10 years, 15 years, 20 year sentences. And so it was also a time during the country where there was an, a, 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 an increase, a very uh, a slow increase in uh, the dialogue around the need to end mass incarceration because in the United States from around 1998 or 1996 to 2008, we built a prison in this country every 10 days um, and crammed it full of poor uh, black people and and and, and uh, uh, poor white folks and um, who were just kind of churned into the criminal legal system. And so we found ourselves to be a country full of people who are in prison, many of them for drug uh, uh, convictions. And we were in prison in 2010 as women. And we heard this increase in the dialogue around the need to end mass incarceration, but we heard nothing about us. We heard nothing about women. We heard nothing about the fact that 85% of incarcerated women are mothers. Um, and they are mothers of children that they were the primary caretakers of prior to them going to prison. We heard none of this information. We didn't hear about the things that our children were going through while we were in prison, that we could do nothing to help uh, them navigate through and to support. And all of the further harm that we knew as women who had been incarcerated in prisons and separated from our children and separated from our families and community um, could uh, 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 contribute to the conversation and about what needed to change if we had been included, but we weren't included. And at the time, no formerly incarcerated people or currently incarcerated people were included in the conversation at all. And so we sat in the prison and we decided to organize ourselves to create that change. Um, and I was released in 2011, and I was one of the first women in our, our group of women that were organizing ourselves in the prison that was allowed to be uh, uh, released. And um, I was uh, tasked, I was given the task by the women in the prison to leave and do what you said you were going to do. Take this work out with you and establish it outside so that you can create a platform for our voices to be heard. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I uh, uh, worked on creating the national platform that we now call the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And our goal then, in 2010, when we started to organize ourselves for the voices, for our voices to be heard, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women, girls, trans and gender nonconforming family of ours, we um, uh, uh, planted the flag of doing work, not just to do criminal justice reform work, but to do work to literally 
and the incarceration of women and girls, trans and gender nonconforming uh, folks um, that are just tangled in the system and most directly affected. And our work has evolved over all the years, but we have never wavered from that being our goal. And today in, two, in 2021, uh, in 2021, uh, we have launched as of January, the national campaign to end incarceration of women and girls. But I just wanna mention Marie, one really important factor is that in the work that we did to try and figure out through participatory research and speaking to women for years in prisons and out of prisons and in the most incarcerated communities in, in, mass, in, in the United States, we knew for sure that the system um, was not gonna dismantle itself anytime soon. We knew for sure that ending incarceration of women and girls was such an immense goal and that we were going to have to try and figure out some other ways that we could begin to pull or, 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 to, or to stop the flow of our uh, families into the prisons. And we came up with a, an organizing infrastructure called Reimagining Communities. So while we work on policies and why we fight, while we fight for clemency and why we, while we fight to close women's prisons and while we uh, fight to divert women from sentences that land them in a prison, we also are, have an infrastructure uh, that is a result of almost three years of participatory research around the country um, that's called Reimagining Communities. And we named it that because there are large nonprofits in this country that have uh, carried a narrative of only reimagining prisons. And quite frankly, we got tired of reimagining prisons. We don't wanna reimagine prisons anymore. And we don't want the resources going to that. We want the resources to go to dismantling this system of incarceration, to closing prisons and to reallocating that funding into um, our communities, the communities that have been most marginalized and uh, under-resourced and under-invested in. And so these two pieces of actually working on a uh, policy that does include uh, conditions of confinement for incarcerated women, making sure they have appropriate feminine hygiene, making sure that they can have phone calls and stay connected to their children, making sure that they're not sentenced thousands of miles away from where their, their children live, uh, making sure that they have the resources that they need while they are incarcerated we are really building up the infrastructure for hyperlocal organizing from within the communities most incarcerated, as well as now having launched in January when uh, President Biden took office, the national campaign that we call the Free Her Campaign to end the incarceration of women and girls in the United States. Um, massive goal we know, but uh, we're, we're figuring it out, uh, figuring out the pieces and how they need to work and, and in, in closing, Marie, you asked me about the 100-day campaign, our 100-day campaign on the day of uh, President Biden's inauguration in January, we launched the 100-day campaign, asking him in his first 100 days of his uh, administration to uh, uh, commute the sentences, to release 100 women in the federal system. And so uh, we're fighting hard for that. We're in about day 40 something, I've lost, count a little bit, uh, but, the, but the campaign will continue to go on. We were very successful under President Obama's administration to push women out of federal prison through his clemency project uh, that started back in 2014. And now that President Biden is, is in office, we have launched this first 100 day campaign. Um, and so more than happy to, to dive into any of those pieces. Uh, but uh, that's pretty much the framework of the work that we do here, all led, all of this work led uh, by uh, uh, currently incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women, girls, uh, trans and gender nonconforming people. Thank you so much, Andrea. So and I much, really Andrea. hope that it works, um, the campaign. And <laughs> the best of luck. We're all with you in spirit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another question. Uh, another another question, question you know about, uh, sorry, let me mute you for a second. Otherwise, it's a bit of echo. Um, so some advocates for criminal legal reform in the US talk a lot about reimagining prisons, which obviously is a big deal in the US where you know, the, industrial, the prison industrial complex is so prominent. 
Um, and you have said that those in the communities most directly affected by incarceration are really tired of reimagining prisons and instead really want to reimagine communities. So could you tell us a bit more about what that means and what the National Council is doing to put that into practice? That's that's really the most exciting work I think that we're we're currently doing. Uh, Reimagining communities is an is a hyperlocal organizing infrastructure that we are working with in within the most incarcerated communities um, that our our members are working in, and it's an infrastructure that includes all of the pieces that our two and a half year listening tour uh, told us the women uh, and, and, and family members and people living in the most incarcerated uh, communities told us they wanted, they needed, not only things that were um, not existing in their communities, certain resources, but also what brings you joy? What are the things that you experience in other communities uh, whether it's green spaces, whether it's parks, whether it's you know projects, whatever it is, that brings you joy. And so two and a half years of going around the country, listening to incarcerated women, formerly incarcerated women, we dumped all this stuff on the table and we came out with this infrastructure. And it includes components such as participatory research, participatory defense, participatory budgeting. It includes a people's assembly process that teaches people how to, uh, demand that people uh, uh, representing them politically, um, the people that they elect to office are actually responsive to the needs of the people. It includes a cooperative business oh, curriculum that helps people, uh, helps uh, our, our, our families and our and formerly so and we are, uh, mass integral and que también our formerly yes. Yes. But Paulina, are you back? Yes. And you can yeah. hear Andrea? Yeah. Yes, I can, I can hear Andrea. For some reason, we can also hear you in Spanish, though. OK. <laughs> is that is that, that, is that, that people are having that now? Paulina, do you want to try again? Try again in Spanish and see if that works. Okay, I can't hear okay, you. I can't hear you. So let's uh, let's give it a try. It sorry, go for it, Andrea. I'm really sorry for. That's okay. okay. <laughs> um, but it it goes it go it, it you, the the whole point of it is that it goes to, the 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 understanding that the prison system and the system of the current criminal legal system in this country that focuses on police and prosecutors and prisons and punishment is not going to dismantle itself soon enough for those of us who are from the communities that are entangled and targeted for police and prosecutors and prisons. And that we had to come up with some different kind of rubric, some different kind of system that was a system that was built on justice, on healing, on not putting people as the only response in prisons. And so in order to get there, we had to build those support systems within the communities most directly affected. And that's what we did with reimagining communities based on all of the information that we received in a two and a half year listening tour. And it's really exciting work now. We're doing everything from building, uh, talking about what's an alternative phone number to been calling the police in times of crisis. It's about, we, we just purchased three hydroponic farms uh, where they're called freight farms and we're putting those in uh, most directly affected communities to help revitalize and to bring fresh produce to communities where uh, there's very little access to fresh produce and to food, particularly after the pandemic. We have uh, started a direct cash basic income guarantee project that's a part of reimagining communities that's providing basic income guarantee to formerly incarcerated women uh, they receive $500 a month, no questions asked, um, just to support uh, them, just because they're, they're women with children uh, who need cash. Um, th these are just a few of the things. We, we, we have uh, cooperative business, uh, businesses started with a, co a cooperative business curriculum um, because uh, 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 women in particular were the last 
hired who are formerly incarcerated anyway before the pandemic, but they were the first fired when the pandemic hit. These women weren't given any warning. They were already cash poor. They didn't have a savings account. So they showed up to work one day and the whole building, the whole business was, sh was shut down because of the pandemic. And they literally never received their last paycheck. And so we have to be creative in finding ways for formerly incarcerated women to create businesses. And so we uh, created this, this cooperative business curriculum uh, which in our country, since post-slavery, for, for many Black communities, cooperative businesses have been a way to generate revenue because we still live in a very racially divided, racist country that the criminal legal system has disproportionately uh, targeted and affected Black families and Black people and Black communities. And so uh, it's important that we find ways in hyper-local communities to uh, reimagine those communities and to create those community villages and the resources in those villages to help people to begin to thrive. When people thrive, they don't commit or cause harm. They are all of the things that we think that having a larger police force or having more prosecutors or having more prisons are going to solve, we know that it doesn't work. And that by allowing communities to begin to thrive and to meet the needs of the people living in those neighborhoods, that's what stops violence and harm and interpersonal harm. And so uh, transformative justice, participatory defense, participatory budgeting, people's assembly process, uh, uh, bringing farms into the neighborhood, hydroponic farms and things like that. Uh, creating that community village is what reimagining communities is about. Thanks so much, Andrea, and amazing job. Like, you know, I'm a big fan of yours and the National Council, and thanks so much for sharing this with us today and also highlighting the, you know, the issues with racism, with COVID-19, with the hardship faced by women and the humanity of the approach that you're promoting. So thank you, it's really, really inspiring, despite all the technical glitches. <laughs> so thank you. Um, Another, another issue that we wanted to highlight uh, within this, this side event was uh, the realities affecting women who use drugs and in particular the stigma and violence that they are facing in their lives. Um, and so to, to kick off the discussion on this issue, I wanted to turn to Gisela Hansen Rodriguez, who's our second speaker today, well, third speaker really. Um, so she works at the Anova International. Uh, Gisela has extensive experience in drug treatment and intervention in therapeutic communities, and she's also a specialist on gender, stigma, and the childhood approach in the field of addictions. She is a board member of the Catalan Federation of Drug Addiction and a member of the RIOD uh, Gender and Stigma Working Group. Gisela is a researcher in the coordinating group of the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona in the Faculty of Psychology, and she is a member of the network of feminist psychotherapists. She's also a professor at the University of Barcelona and is responsible for the therapeutic coordination of treatment programs of Vianova, Spain. Um, so Gisela, what are the most prevalent perceptions on women who use drugs that contribute to stigma? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm so glad to be here and share the panel. Um, I'm going to do my intervention in Spanish. Is that good for the translation? Okay. Yeah, so first of all, I would like to uh, say that... Sorry, I turned off my translation because I'm going crazy on my voice. First of all, I would like to say that um, there's a lot of preconceived notions that are very stigmatizing um, about women who use drugs. And and so, in women who use drugs, um, they face greater stigma and they face greater discrimination at the hands of society. In general, the stereotype of the stigma is that they have very chaotic lives, very unstable lives, and above all, and when it comes to uh, caretaking, and 
who, uh, women who use drugs are seen as not being able to take care of themselves and much less being able to take care of others, caretakers. And, and this, is a, this is a stigma that um, also extends to other communities, for example, the trans community of trans women. And these are, these are communities that are really much more marginalized and um, they're viewed in a very, uh, in a very stigmatized way. So we need to think about how we can address stigma, how we can respond to it, um, and how we can uh, uh, how we can deconstruct the notion that women need to be caretakers and, and, and that women need to be mothers and, and that this is the only thing that we value them for. And this is something that it really comes down to an institutional problem. And what we're really looking at here is having to address institutional discrimination. Thanks for that, Gisela. Sorry, I was trying to, uh, I was waiting for the interpretation Thanks, to catch up. Um, so how, so once we, we deconstruct stigma, um, you know, one of the issues that we need to understand clearly as well is how stigma impacts on women's drug use, but also their access to harm reduction and treatment services. So could you tell us a bit more about this? Sí, de hecho, um, hay un acuerdo desde, es decir, las barreras de género asociadas a... So, when it comes to the issue of gender and how this affects uh, things, there is an agreement. And it's, some, it's something that really has to do with people's ability to access services and how they really overcome the difficulties that they face as a result of like societal stigma. So because of the uh, sexism that exists in society, this is what informs the stigma and discrimin discrimination that women and for example, when uh, a woman um, is looking for services um, that aren't accessible to women or that haven't taken the issue of gender into account, uh, this means that they are not able to access services that are, that are adapted to their needs. And the, the services that they are accessing do not respond to the specific needs of women. Because these, uh, these services are often formed with a male perspective and they're more geared towards women, but towards men, don't take into account uh, the specific needs that many women have. And we're going to need to really uh, to broaden the, the scope of these services and to really make sure that we're specifically addressing the needs of different populations that were not only coming from the very male centric Yeah, so in the case of a woman who uh, it means that um, she's going to be facing many more obstacles and much more of an uphill battle as a result of her gym. And uh, uh, a woman drug user, and there, the but having to access services really aren't adapted to them, but aren't suitable for them. And they're expected to continue fulfilling the security role that we were speaking about earlier, and that society expects of women, and that is also informed by these gender norms and, and sexism. And Many times women go a very long time without being able to access public services or never being able to access the school because they're not adapted to me. And these, uh, this, they're also affected by, by stereotypes and norms that are extremely prevalent in our society and in the country. And this means that women uh, suffer on, on various levels. Not only are they um, 
unable to access corporate everything in the form of a perspective as a can't account. And needs, but they're also facing the stigma of being drug users. So there, there are multiple levels to it, and, and there's the intersection there of the stigma and discrimination. Yeah, and I think addressing the double stigma faced by women for being a woman and for using drugs is really difficult. Um, and I was wondering from Dianova's experience, uh, how can we practically address this double stigma through better designed prevention, harm reduction and treatment services? What's, um, it, it would be great if you could share a bit more about that as well. Okay. Um... Algunos aspectos prácticos, sí que antes... Eh, well, there are some practical steps that we can do. What I would highlight is that there's a universal stigma against drugs, but it's been enforced in women. And because of that, they face this kind of intersection of the stigma that is really the killer here, the stigma that is harm. And whenever in a therapeutic perspective, for example, when a woman is, is going to harm reduction services, and they're having to face even more barriers in this therapeutic context, where we have sex consumption or very struggles Honestly, what we see here is that we're really holding short when it comes to uh, having a good enough scope to be able to respond to the women, provide them adequate services that are Many times, the fear is one of the issues that was really discouraging. Young women, especially, are often less able to appropriate services um, because there's believed in other, other stereotypes, other stigma associated with drug use. For example, women are supposed to be or, or permissive. There's this extra layer of um, violence, really. Um, and they would have to Help with child care, help with uh, education, all of the 
things that, that inform the, the, the context and the situations that lead uh, people to, to drug use in the first place. This is where we need to start. Thank you so much, Isela, for that. And um, I think this also shows that there is a real need to include the voices of women who use drugs themselves in the design and um, implementation of services that affect them to make sure that they're not counterproductive, but also that really respond to their gender specific needs. Um, hopefully, <laughs> that will uh, that will be more the case. But uh, for example, there is a, um, a program called Metineres in Barcelona that really is driven by women for women. So I encourage mm -hmm. you all to have a look at this program, which is quite interesting in the way it works, uh, and that really empowers women who use drugs and are not stigmatizing, and really try also to address the issues related mm -hmm. to violence. Um, so thanks so much, Isela, for that. And I'm really sorry about Thank all the translation much. hiccups. Gracias, Mari. Solo comentar un último pensamiento, yeah, sure. que es tener en cuenta... Eh, I just wanted to add um, one other thing. So, we need to also keep in mind the process. And so, what I mean by this is um, the, the processes that women are going through in their lives in the different stages. This is something that we need to keep in mind, and it needs to inform the treatment and services that we provide. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's that's incredibly important. Um, so so we now are going to talk a little bit more about the issue specifically of violence against women who use drugs. Um, this is an issue that the Women and Harm Reduction International Network has been working on quite a lot over the past few years. And our next panelist is Ruth Virgin. She is the coordinator of the Women and Harm Reduction International Network, uh, also known as RIM. Um, Ruth has been very active in the field of drug user organizing and harm reduction since the 1980s, uh, initially in Australia, and since the early 2000s at international level, uh, with a particular focus on Asia and East Africa. And throughout her work, she's very much focused on issues affecting women who use drugs and explored some innovative solutions to bring real change at service delivery levels. Uh, so RIN has grown exponentially over the past few years and is proving to be quite an effective vehicle for working with women who use drugs and others to understand and address the gender gaps in harm reduction service provision. Um, because of the time zone difference, Ruth is unfortunately not with us today, uh, but she has put together a great video which gives a visual representation of the RIN campaign to eliminate violence against women who use drugs. And the images that are included in this video have been provided by campaign participants from over around 20 countries to give us a glimpse of the energy and activism of women who use drugs. And that goes back to what Mary was saying at the beginning around the courage and motivation that drives women who use drugs to claim their rights. So bear with me for a second. I will, put, uh, uh, I will share the video and hopefully the sound will work as well. All right, let's check this one out. Hello, this presentation highlights how women who use drugs and our allies are fighting back against the systemic violence generated by prohibition and punitive responses to drug use. In particular, we're focusing on the Elimination of Violence Against Women Who, who Use Drugs campaign, or Eva Wood. My name is Ruth Bergen, and I work as coordinator for the Women and Harm Reduction International Network, or RIN. The mission of RIN is to accelerate access to quality harm reduction services for women who use drugs. And the vision is that all women who use drugs have uh, ready access to services out in a context uh, with, of no judgment and decriminalization. Not only do women who use drugs experience much higher rates of violence than other women at the hands of intimate partners as well as from the state, but women drug users also lack legal recourse due to the criminalised status of drug use. Stigma, gender inequality and criminalisation have combined to create conditions where violence is not only common but also, in practical terms, effectively sanctioned and endorsed. 
RIN advocacy works to bring these conditions into sharp relief and to promote immediate and longer term normative guidance to respond to and ultimately end such human rights violations against women who use drugs. For example, with the support of the Robert Carr Fund, RIN has been able to coordinate a small grants program to enable campaigns led by women who use drugs to call attention to systemic violence against our community in respective local or national contexts. To give you some background on how this campaign was founded, uh, it can be seen as part of the RIN effort to collaborate more closely with the women's movement, which has otherwise tended to exclude engagement with women who use drugs and the impact of prohibition. After all, gender-based violence cannot be eliminated if those most affected are not directly and meaningfully involved in all levels in relevant policy and programming. As you know, the pre-existing UN effort was initiated by feminists in the 1980s and then marked by the UN in the 90s, building to an annual 16 days of activism starting on November the 25th, the International Day for Observance of Elimination of Violence Against Women, with 16 days of action through to December the 10th, International Human Rights Day. It uses the colour orange to colour the world with efforts to stop violence against women. Higher rates of violence suffered, coupled with the absence of attention to women who use drugs in this global UN campaign, led us to the initiation of Eva Wood, the elimination of violence against women who use drugs. As with the wider UN campaign, Eva Wood adopts the use of the colour orange and runs from November 25th to December 10th, leaving scope for 16 days of activism, but with a special focus on women who use drugs. The Eva Wood campaign is growing each year and already has been enhanced by partnership engagement from networks such as Euro Input and Youth Rise. RIN collects summaries of actions held to create a global roundup report that is shared widely, particularly with key agencies of the international women's movement. It is beyond high time that women who use drugs are included in feminist discourse and that weight is given to truly leaving no woman behind. Flashing through this presentation are images and participant quotes from the 2019 and 2020 campaigns, which were run across more than 20 countries. They give you a glimpse of the energy, bravery, creativity and determination of the activists involved. The Eva Wood campaign activities have included awareness raising, correcting of negative perceptions and the presentation of requests and demands for rectification in the form of social media blitzes, the launch of lived experience books, videos and webinars, art and sport activities, press releases, public marches, demonstrations and rallies, podcasts, storytelling, formal meetings with parliamentarians, police, community lawyers, health officials and women's ministries, national symposiums, music concerts with bespoke rap performances, letter writing to women who use drugs in prison, art therapy, empowerment and self-defense classes and more. During an Eva Wood talk for women who use drugs on how to assert rights in an arrest situation, a participant asked, are these things we have to learn to live with? Rin call on the global women's movement to answer this woman with a resounding no and to actively improve efforts to ensure meaningful engagement with women who use drugs. Please see some footage from Youth Rise Nigeria and Club Eni in Ukraine that made up part of their actions in their respective Eva Wood campaigns. An integration is again being emphasized as Nigeria joins the world to mark uh, the International Human Rights Day. The plight of female psychoactive drug users was the focus at the Mogadishu Kentumen football pitch in Abuja. Some female victims of police brutality who were our drug users engaged the police machines team in a novelty match. tell them that drug users are also women. 
they are not criminals. So they should stop discriminating and stigmatizing drug users. You know, people doing drug use, there are many situations involved. Some people, maybe it's family issue or other this thing, or maybe being abused. So we won't tell them that as in being a drug user doesn't mean your life has ended. The impact of the campaign has been felt in ways well beyond those originally anticipated. In addition to media coverage and capturing the notice of governments, some participating women who use drugs report a profound sense of vindication and empowerment. In some cases, the campaigns have triggered ongoing activities, such as women-only days or auxiliary service additions and adjustments in drug user networks and among harm reduction providers wishing to improve their relevance to women who use drugs. In several locations, Eva Wood activity has led to the establishment of resource packs and expanded referral networks, ongoing meetings of women who use drugs geared towards building advocacy actions, the establishment of new networks of women who use drugs, and the, the strengthening of women's roles in existing networks of people who use drugs. To learn more about RIN and our collective work on ending violence against women who use drugs, please visit the website at whrin.site, S-I-T-E. Thank you. I would like to thank Ruth and all the wonderful women who contributed to this amazing video. Um, a quick reminder to the participants, if you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please put them in the chat box. Obviously, Ruth is not with us today, but if you want to put in a question there, and I can forward it to her as well and put in your contact details in there. Um, so, so I know we're quickly running out of time, and I want to make sure that Kenya has plenty of time to share her story. So, Another aspect that is completely invisibilized in drug policy is the high situation of vulnerability faced by trans women. And this is particularly problematic when we see the levels of violence and stigma um, that they are facing as women who use drugs and while they are incarcerated. So I'm really grateful for Kenya Cuevas um, for being here with us today. Kenya is a wonderful activist uh, from Mexico who fights for the rights of the LGBTQ plus community. In 2019, she founded the civil association Casa de las Muñecas Tiresias, which provides support to low-income populations, people deprived of liberty, people who use drugs, people living on the streets, people living with HIV, sex workers, and all those who identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community. In 2020, she opened a first shelter for trans women in Mexico, named after Paola Buenrostro, through which she supports trans women to lead a life free of violence. Kenya has received several awards, including the Medal of Woman of the Year, a distinction awarded by the Congress of Mexico City. So congratulations, Kenya, for that. Um, so Kenya, incarceration has disproportionate impacts on women and their families, but trans women are faced with even worse situations due to the levels of stigma, discrimination, and violence, which are sadly parts of their daily lives. So could you tell us about your own experience within the criminal legal system and what are the particular challenges that trans women are facing when they are deprived of liberty? Yeah. Oh, one second. I just have to switch. Yeah.
Paulina, can you hear Kenya? Uh, yes, now, now I hear her. Perfect, okay. So, um, I wanted to, uh, I, I'm here today to speak a little bit about uh, trans women um, specifically when we're talking about uh, the violence and stigma faced by, by women. Uh, so as trans women, we face um, a very a very specific um, and a, an additional form of, of violence. Um, there's an extra layer there. Um, when we're criminalized, we are often uh, penalized as as men. They, they they treat us as men, um, and we face uh, a lot, uh, many more obstacles. Um, many times we are not able to access different services. And many times we have to turn to sex work in order to uh, support ourselves. And then we end up in a situation where we're completely abandoned by society. We are almost completely cast to one side. Um, there's a lack of justice. There's a, a lot of impunity. Um, the violence that we face, the violence faced by the trans community and the, the sex worker community uh, is something that is very, it's not, it's not often um, brought to justice. Uh, these, these incidents that we face, incidents of violence are uh, usually ignored by society at large. And it's not something that, um, where, where we often see justice. So, there, there is a built-in difficulty there for people who, who use drugs, but for um, the trans community, the, the violence is even greater and the risks that we run are, are even more severe. Uh, so in Mexico, there's a law that, um, that stipulates that uh, a woman who, um, who identifies this way uh, cannot change her status um, legally. So we are victims of violence um, through, these, uh, through these institutionalized processes as well. We are deprived and stripped of our identities. Our identities are not recognized. We're discriminated against. We, uh, we face violence. We are, we are abused. Um, in, inside the, the penal system, we are uh, deprived of our rights um, because uh, for, for, being, for being women, for being drug users, and on top of that, for being trans women. And, and so this is something that has a, a huge, huge negative toll um, psychologically, emotionally, mentally, physically. Uh, and it's something that um, means that we we live in, in when when we're when we're incarcerated, um, it, it makes the issue even more complicated and even more difficult, and uh, because um, there's 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 lack of access to adequate services for women who uh, use drugs in in prison and and tra trans women it's even harder and. With the great toll that um, that being trans and all the violence that we have to suffer, with the, the toll that this takes on us, um, it's even more likely that we're going to be struggling uh, with our drug dependency issues and with um, uh, accessing drugs in prison. And so, ninety-eight percent. Of, uh, of trans women who are incarcerated do not, are not able to access the right that they have to adequate legal representation within prisons. And um, these are just, that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to uh, the issues that trans women face in Mexico when we are incarcerated. Um, and that's only the beginning. There's many more forms of violence and discrimination and stigma that we face. And um, there's a lack of in, uh, support on the institutional level. There's a lack of, uh, of support. There's a lack of organizations that are able to, uh, 
to to provide us with um, services. And once once we are released from prison as well, there is hardly any support provided to us uh, with coping with life on the outside, um, finding employment, for example, it's extremely difficult to secure employment, and there is little to no support for our community. And there's really nothing when it comes to helping us reintegrate into society. So what does this all mean? What this means is that trans women are left without any tools we have no access to services to be able to, to cope and to survive in this machista, um, sexist society where we face so much violence. Um, and as someone who's been incarcerated, it's even worse. You have even less access to opportunities, even less access to services. And, and there's, there's, there's tools um, that some some other people may be able to access, but that, that we are not, we are excluded from them. And this all comes down to institutionalized issues at the end of the day, institutionalized discrimination. We're not able to even legally change our identities. Our identities are not accepted. They are not validated. And from that, the fact that our base identity is not even legally accepted, this has a knock-on effect on everything else where we're not able to uh, access anything else, any other help that we need to, to survive and to, to cope in, in society. And uh, it's very, very difficult for our, uh, for our community and for trans women, especially those who use drugs and those who are incarcerated. Um, so, There are some spaces where we would we would envision women, trans women who uh, who have uh, drug de dependency, to be able to come in and not be judged and be able to find support. So what we're doing right now is we are working on a project uh, that would um, be within the prison system, and right now it's in the pilot stage. It's a pilot project. And we're working with, uh, with trans women um, to be able to uh, provide them with legal advice. We're bringing in uh, um, attorneys, lawyers who can advise them and provide them uh, legal counsel about um, how to best access services. Another example, um, uh, for, for, so uh, one of these certified Attorneys may come in and say that, okay, look, this is your case. This is this is how the procedures are going to go, um, and they they help advise them on these legal issues. And ultimately, what we're doing is we're going to help get these women out of prison sooner. Um, and there are also uh, networks that we're going to be creating, support groups, um, for 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 these for these women, um, because so many of these women have no one. They don't have, they don't have family who support them. They don't have a significant other. They don't have a partner. Um, they don't have children. Uh, and they, they really are alone. So it's so important uh, to, for us to create these social, um, the, the social element, the, these support groups uh, and, and different networks where uh, uh, trans women can, can connect with each other and, and share resources and uh and and commiserate and uh, so this is something that uh we're working towards to be able to create an a, stra uh, a strategy uh, to ensure that trans women in prison uh, and and uh who use drugs are not deprived of their rights within prison but rather that they they enjoy the same rights as as uh, everyone else that they, that they are uh, entitled to under the law, and then also when they leave the, when they leave prison, that they are able to access the appropriate services to help them reintegrate into society. Um, we're going to be also uh, as part of this project. We are working on awareness raising. We're going to be 
uh, holding sponsored football matches or soccer matches, for example. Um, and we're going to be having people come and speak and tell us their, their personal stories and uh, raise awareness in that way. Uh, what, what we want to do uh, is continue with the, the work that we've already been doing. Um, we have very clear objectives. We have a very clear vision of where we want to get in the future. And this is uh, something that our organization has been, it started off um, as, a, as a small group of, of friends and now it's grown. And um, honestly, we, we say that the, the best form of revenge is for us to be happy in the future. And that's what we're working towards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kenya. And the work that you're doing is, you know, as, as I was telling Andrea, it's, it's really inspiring and well, well done because it, it must be so difficult and having these support systems for trans women so that they can share their stories and come together and, you know, work together towards a system that is different is, is just so, so needed. So, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, before we move on to the questions, I think we have 10 minutes uh, more before we're shut out of the platform. I just wanted to ask you whether uh, you wanted to talk a tiny bit more about uh, Casa Hogar Paola Buenrostro uh, in terms of the, some of the stuff that you're doing in, in helping women uh, after they've been decarcerated. Uh, so if you want to say a few words on that, and then there's a couple of questions that we can address with the rest of the speakers. Escuchaste la pregunta, Kenia? Okay, maybe there is a problem with the sound. So, so let's uh, for now let's move on to the Q and A. And if there is more more time, maybe Kenya can uh, can address the question on uh, on Casa Hogar Paula Buen Rostro. Um, so there, there are three questions that I've seen and uh, many comments saying thank you to all the panelists and well done on the, on the amazing work that is being done. So thanks guys for that, keep it coming. We, we, we like receiving some love. Um, so one question was actually for Mary. Uh, somebody was asking whether there is any movement to legalize marijuana in Africa. There are many pros and cons to that. The obvious benefit is a decrease in incarceration. So Mary, are you... I don't know if you can hear us, um, but uh, do you have any information on that? Mary, can you hear us? I have unmuted you so you can talk. Or, no, can I unmute you? Maybe I can't actually. Uh, somebody was asking whether there is any movement to legalize marijuana in Africa. There are many pros and cons to that. The obvious benefit is a decrease in incarceration. So Mary, are you, I don't know if you can hear us, yes, um, but yes. so do you have any information on that? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, well, uh, recently, because of all the advocacy, there's a lot more openness to the whole situation. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. I'm, what I'm saying is because of so much advocacy work which is uh, taking place on the continent, many governments are becoming more open to the whole concept of we don't like the word legalization we say decriminalization. And um, what we're trying to really say is for our governments, especially in Africa, to take into account all the developments which have taken place in, uh, on this particular subject matter, also at the international level, and to 
try to ensure that uh, the whole drug area would be made to respond to the international protocols which have been put together. We have said that so long as you refer to whatever is happening in the area is war on drugs, uh, you're not going to make headway. And uh, because of that, uh, yes, many governments are looking at the issues and trying to see how to assist people who have uh, uh, need um, uh, or are being incarcerated or all that we have heard is negatively impacting on people who use drugs. And then recently, of course, uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, medical marijuana, which is bringing a completely new aspect to looking at this particular issue. Uh, there's a lot of work now um, going on. If I take my country, Ghana, I can say that uh, we actually have had a law passed through parliament which is looking at this issue in a completely different way and working hard at decriminalization. So there's a lot happening. Thank you, Mary, for that. Um, a second question is for An Andrea. Uh, Andrea, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So one okay. question one was question. asked around, sorry, let me just move Mary. Uh, okay. Um, considering that a majority of incarcerated women have a history of physical and sexual abuse, does this community-centered project include resources for survivors? survivors. If they do, if they can do, you speak they... about what these resources are and what implementation looks like? I work with survivors and would love to continue your successful work in my community. Yeah. Um, and first of all, I just want to say, you know, in our um, neighborhoods, um, the, there's really no bright line between people who, some people refer to themselves as victims, some people refer to themselves as survivors. Um, there's, there's no bright line uh, between that um, in uh, communities. Um, uh, and the transformative justice work that we've been learning about and experimenting with um, we, uh, you know, Mariam Kaba has uh, provided extensive work in this area who has helped us to learn more. She has a really great new book out. We do this until we're free. This is Mariam's uh, new book. I encourage you to check it out if you're interested in uh, different processes that help us to address interpersonal, uh, 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 individual and community accountability in regard to interpersonal harm. And so our work is really centered around that uh, when it comes to people uh, causing harm to one another, uh, which includes sexual harm, uh, which includes finding ways of working to uh, address the harms. We have a series of working groups going on at the National Council right now where formerly incarcerated and currently incarcerated women are meeting on a weekly basis uh, uh, in groups, uh, depending on how they were convicted and incarcerated for what, such as uh, addiction, uh, 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 personal uh, uh, crimes. We don't really use that term. We use transgressions instead. Uh, we, we try and use language that connotes that people have an opportunity uh, that have the, the, the possibility to transform their lives. Um, and so these are all the pieces that fall kind of under this, this, this infrastructure of, of transformative justice, um, which uh, allows us to learn the language and some practices um, and to experiment with how do we begin to address within ourselves uh, uh, sexual trauma, how it may have affected our lives, uh, but also uh, how we address harm and identify harm um, and create the opportunities within our neighborhoods to address harm so that people who are causing harm know that that is harm. There's a, there's a lot of uh, things that have happened in our culture um, that um, we won't 
uh, dig deep enough into to talk about in terms of harm um, and that we have to uproot in our neighborhoods um, and uh, so that people have an opportunity, such as Ken, Kenya describes to us the harm that trans women uh, go through. Um, and we want to be able to allow the people in our neighborhoods to define harm for themselves so that we can help to educate people about all the pieces of harm, all the ways that people uh, uh, feel that their lives have been affected by harm and violence. And that includes sexual violence, but often there are uh, folks who, and women who have been uh, 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 victims of sexual violence who have caused harm through sexual violence. And until we get you know, to a place where we can really put uh, that, those feelings of harm and those incidents of harm on the table and take the punishment aspect out of it and work on healing, uh, we're never going to get there because people will continue to cause harm and prison will be the answer. And you go and you sit on a prison bunk, but you never, and, and that causes further harm, particularly because there's a high incidence of harm, sexual harm that's caused to women from uh, uh, prison guards while they are incarcerated. Um, and they, they're not given the opportunity to address that harm in any way, whether they caused it as a result of the harm that was done to them, whether uh, they uh, want to uh, 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 figure out a way to, to help other folks that are causing harm to figure out um, how to stop doing that, how to stop the harm. Uh, which Andrea, is I'm so sorry to cut you, but the, the session will stop in one minute. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to, to say thank you to everyone and everyone and I'm really sorry for technical glitches, but but I just didn't I want Andrea to be cut off without me having the opportunity to say thanks to, to all our wonderful panelists for their courage, their strength, and their work, um, and, and to all of you for being with us today, um, uh, all of the organizers, organizers for this event, and Juan, uh, my colleague Juan, who has been able to handle the logistics, and many, many thanks to Paulina uh, Rechanga, who is our interpreter and who has done a great job this time. Uh, all odds. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone. I hope we can continue the, the, the debate on this important issue at future CSWs. Um, and keep an eye out on our website, on the websites of our panelists, uh, to see what comes out of these discussions in the future. Um, so thank you so much. Have a lovely evening, afternoon, or day, depending on where you are. And I hope that we will be able to be in touch soon again. Thanks, everyone.